Today, I want to talk from the topic, how to go there, to know there. And I'll be using as a text the first chapter of John, verse 19 through 23, where it says, this is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Phoebe, you got to go there to know there. Your papa and your mama and nobody else can tell you and show you. Two things everybody's got to do for themselves. They got to go to God and they got to find out about living for themselves. Those were some powerful words spoken by Janie, the protagonist in Zora Neale Hurston's novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. In the book, Janie was reared by her grandmother who was fearful of what would happen to Janie when she could no longer protect her. So she forced Janie to marry an aging domineering farmer. He offered Janie security, but that security came at the high price of suppressing Jamie's spirit which saw itself far beyond the confines of farm life. She was then able to escape that fate when she married Joe Starks, a man with visions of greatness and grandeur. Joe Starks landed in a town where he was able to build it up and become mayor. And he expected Janie to live life on a pedestal, a pedestal that raised her above the rest of the community. She was expected to live the exalted life of the mayor's wife, but that was not Janie's desire. So it kept, kept them at odds until Joe Starks died. And then she met Tea Cake, who was much younger than she was. But as Janie said about meeting him, she felt her soul crawl out of its hiding place. She had found someone who loved her for herself. This enabled Janie to peel away the false images that had been forced upon her and enabled her to embrace her true self. Their eyes were watching God as an insightful, enlightening, and soul-searching piece of art that everyone should read. Some of us go through our whole life not realizing just how much our lives have been shaped by other people's opinions, expectations, and limitations. I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions, their lives mimicry, and their passions a quotation. That's the problem with much of our society today, lack of original thought, hence lack of self-awareness. We live in a time of racial and political groupthink, which is limiting and dangerous. I may get in trouble for saying this, but when I saw how many senators and the leadership of about 18 states signed onto some nonsense seeking before the Supreme Court to disenfranchise millions of Americans. I could not help but think that this is the kind of thinking that fueled the spread of Hitler's ideology and the same rationale that enabled good Christian folk to steal people from another continent and bring them this, to this country to live as slaves or the kind of thinking that made it all right to steal the land and the way of life away from Native Americans. We need to be able to process for ourselves, know ourselves, and be able to reason our own sense of right and wrong, hopefully through the lenses of love and justice. Steve, John, Steve Jobs once said, don't let the noise of other people's opinion drown out your own inner voice. This is especially true when it comes to our own self-awareness of who we really are, or who we really want to be. The scripture for today tells the story of one who knew exactly who he was and what he was here for. The text comes out of the Gospel of John, 
Actually, like the other gospels, the author is not really known. But some in the second century said it was John, the disciple who Jesus loved, and or John, the son of Zebedee. The author and those for whom he wrote understood themselves to be a persecuted religious minority, expelled from the synagogue because of their faith in Jesus. This expulsion happened most frequently after the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, and that would locate the date of this text as sometime between 75 and 100 AD. The text for today tells the story of John the Baptist. It actually refers to this as the testimony of John the Baptist. In this case, testimony, testimony had a couple of meanings. First, it's a public accounting of a religious experience. And secondly, it's a spoken statement, especially one given in a court of law. John's testimony on one hand spoke of his relationship with God through Christ. And on the other hand, he was responding to an interrogation by those in an official delegation sent by Jewish religious establishment. They had heard that people were heading out to the wilderness to be baptized by John and that he had groups of people following his teaching. Even today, there's a group in Iraq who trace their history back to John the Baptist. And you know what happens when folks think they're in control as the Jewish religious establishment thought. They have to keep others who threaten their power, they have to try to keep them in check. So they asked John, who are you? And it's interesting to note that John's response was not, well, I am, no. He responded, I am not the Christ. And then they asked, are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? They asked this because in Judaism, those were a couple of ways the expected Messiah was spoken about. Elijah was taken up to heaven without dying, so many Jews expected him re to return as a forerunner of the Messiah. There was similar thought about a prophet like Lo Moses as a messianic figure. The implication of their questioning was that there must have been some people who thought that John was the Messiah. But John very emphatically replied, no, those were identities they were trying to place on him. He had been a different kind of person, or had he been a different kind of person, he could have pretended to be those exalted beings. But John was all about being his true self. So he emph emphatically said, no. Which led them to finally ask, well, who do you say you are? To which John boldly re replied, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. He was not the Messiah, but he was the one who was to prepare the way for the Messiah. That question that was asked of John, what do you say about yourself, is a good question that could be asked of all of us. We've had parents try to brand us, spouses try to brand us, friends, employers, coworkers, society at large. You know, women are this way and men are that way, or don't act too grown, or nobody like you has ever done that. You're black, you're white, you're gay, you're straight, you're lesbian, you're bisexual, you're transgender, you're too young, you're too old, you have a disability. Who do you think you are? I remember back in my early 20s, I dated and lived with someone who was not very helpful. When we first got together, we lived in a boarding house in Newark, New Jersey. And then we moved up to share an apartment with a friend. And within a few months, I got us our own apartment. Then I got a better job. And then I bought a new, new car. And then I went back to college. But when we decided, or I decided that we needed to move somewhere that didn't have roaches who lived rent free. My beloved asked me, what's wrong with you? Do you think you're white or something? I heard that. I heard that loud and clear. And I knew I had to make a choice. I needed to follow a path that led to the kind of life I wanted or else I could stay at a level where someone else wanted to keep me. Now that's not to say I never saw another roach in my lifetime. But it was time to move on from that apartment 
the time to move from that relationship. You know, I did not have all the answers about my life in my early 20s. I was still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure it out today. But like John, I knew who I was not. Much like Janie, in their eyes were watching God, many of us figure out who we really are as we go along as life teaches us who we are and who we are not. Most of us have had moments in our lives when we struggle with a sense of identity. Identity encompasses the memories, the experiences, the relationships, and the values that create our sense of self. Identity involves three key tasks. Number one, it's discovering and developing one's potential. Number two is choosing or discovering one's purpose in life. And finally, it's finding opportunities to exercise that potential and purpose. Each of these tasks will continue to evolve over a lifetime. Even if we don't change what we do, we may change how we do it. It's important to remember that examination of our true self is a lifelong process. We need to take time to identify and chip away at those things that no longer serve us. We're like a sculptor chipping away at a block of granite in order to reveal the beautiful image that lies within. It's also true that identities shift over time. Sometimes we cross various milestones in life and it causes us to reevaluate or to live in a different way. Teenagers go through times of identity shifting. When we move out of our parents' house, we, we shift. When we go to college, when we get married, when we become a parent, when we start or end a relationship, when we go through seasons of loss, whether it be loss of a loved one, a job, our health, or our ability, those are all times when we go through a shift. And you know, some of us are even waking up with a little bit more aches and pains than we used to have. Or we have to reach for our reading glasses a little bit more or move the page further away when we're trying to read. I remember a major shift about 10 or 15 years ago. You know, for years I have been asked to participate in panels at colleges and churches, conferences at organizations. Usually it was to speak about homosexuality and the church or homosexuality and the Bible. I always saw myself as that cool progressive pastor on the panel. But on this particular occasion, I was at Morehouse College. And you know, on panel, when you participate on a panel, usually at the end, they open the floor for questions. And this time a young man stood up, I thought he stood up to ask a question, but he stood up, went to the microphone and he said, I just want to say how honored we are that our elders came to share with us this afternoon. Elders, me? I thought about that thing for days. Then I realized I was probably older than that boy's mom. And it made me think that maybe it is time to shift from trying to be an activist to being an advisor of activists. But for a moment, I was like Janie in the book where she says, it says she stood there until so something fell off the shelf inside her. That thing shook me. Sometimes meaningful identity shifts are triggered by outside events or statements, but they should only push you back inside of yourself to see what, if any truth, there is about what was said or what was received. You know, it's critical to ourselves and to our communities that we discover our true identity so we can live from a place that we love and respect ourselves and other people. I remember reading something in a book by Ed Wimberly that suggested that we need to be healthy and whole persons even if we feel like we are deserving of equality and justice. It's hard to feel like we're deserving if we haven't learned how to be whole and how to be healthy emotionally and physically. Even to vote, we need to have respect and love for ourselves. Because who are we speaking for? Who are we standing for if we don't feel worthy? 
Eric Erickson said, in the social jungle of human existence, there is no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity. But there are a few things that we can do to help us own or to evolve into our true identity. I got this out of psychology today, and I'm only going to read a subset of the things that they suggested. But they said we should observe ourselves objectively, kind of be like a fly on the wall and observe how we act, how we think, what we do. And we ought to examine our family belief systems because sometimes we're living out things that we just took on from childhood. And we didn't stop and see, is this truly what I believe? We have to examine our doubts and see if our doubts are really there. Why are they there? Are they true? Is it, is it real that we really doubt something about our lives and ourselves? We have to develop courage to face our fears. We have to explore our own values, our own integrity, our own ethics, and live our values every day and live out of that space all the time. We need to learn to love ourselves and have compassion for other people. And we have to release patterns of belief that no longer serve us. You know, we're at a place where we can define who we are. We're at a place where we must define who we are. We need to be able to have our own testimony. How would we answer that question about identity? I'm glad today because God has allowed me to live long enough to know exactly who I am. It was a long road to get here. It had lots of ups and downs, it had curves, it had twists and turns, but I'm standing in a good place today as my full self. So if someone were to ask me who I am, I can boldly say, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, a pastor, an artist who works as a project manager to pay my bills. We should all have a bold response, just like John the Baptist had. We should be able to say, I am, or I am not. But mostly, we should land strong with the I am. This is a sermon, it may sound strange, but it's a sermon that has homework. Because you got to go there to know them. So we need to identify some things about our identity. So I'm going to invite you to write your own identity statement. Get a pad of paper and a good writing pen. You know, I need a pen that flows nicely. And I am going old school. I'm inviting you to actually write, not type. But get a pad of paper and write along the top what I say about myself. And then list what you've come to believe about yourself. And then take a few moments or maybe take a day and go back and look at your list and see if there's anything you want to change. If so, turn the paper over or get another sheet of paper and write at the top things I want to say about myself. And then live into that list. It's a good way and a good place to identify our own sense of identity. You define who you are. You try to understand, work with God and work with your life and figure out who you are. In closing, I agree with Janie, who said in their eyes, we're watching God. There is two things everybody got to find out for their self. They got to find out about love and they got to find out about living. I invite you to live into your true, wonderful self. Find your identity and live boldly into that. Thank you for listening.